Hello, this is Richard Pierce from Finextra TV, and uh, I'm delighted today to be joined uh, by two uh, uh, great associates from uh, AFME. Um, I've got uh, Tonya, Associate Director of Policy, and I've got Rick, who's uh, MD at AFME, uh, joining us. And we're going to have an interesting conversation about a report they've put together, uh, and particularly around the growth of obviously uh, sustainable finance and uh, uh, you know, the policy, the regulatory efforts, et cetera, there's a big impact going through the financial services industry. Um, and so what I wanted to hear from is uh, Rick to tell us a little bit about who AFME are, um, and then we'll talk a bit about the report with uh, with both Tonya and Rick. So hi to you, and Rick, tell us who are AFME and a bit about you. Uh, Richard, we're delighted to be here today. And uh, just by way of background, AFME, which is the Association for Financial Markets Europe, is a trade association uh, covering the pan-European capital markets. Um, although we're based in London, our remit and our focus is actually the EU27, a pan-European geographic capital markets basis. And we have offices in uh, Brussels, London, and Frankfurt. Um, I run our capital markets event and membership team. And our goal is to represent the, all capital markets issues in equity, fixed income, and other areas that impact the capital market side of the major banks. We also have a major prudential division, which is relevant to this discussion because it's actively engaged with sustainable finance initiatives as well. Tonya? Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, delighted to be here likewise. Uh, my name is Tonya Plachetniuk, and I'm Associate Director of the Policy Division at AFME, and I lead AFME's program on sustainable finance. As you know, banks and capital markets have a crucial role to play in helping the economy to transform into um, low carbon and sustainable more generally. And we work with our members to ensure that uh, our voice is heard by the EU policymakers when they shape the new um, legislation and regulation in this space. Fantastic. So in that regard, then, you've got with the EU Sustainable Finance Strategy, they put out a consultation uh, request, I suppose, and on behalf of your members, you've responded with this report, uh, which is available. Um, tell us a bit more ab about that and sort of, you know, the background to that. And then, you know, perhaps um, talking around this the transition to 2050 uh, and the net zero carbon future. So, I think, uh, Tonya, give us a bit more on the work you've done there, which is very impressive. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so it all started primarily with the EU action plan on, sustain on, on finance, financing sustainable growth back in 2018, uh, which revealed a set of uh, legislative and non-legislative measures, again, to help um, the economy to transition. It followed uh, with the release of the uh, European Green Deal in December 2019. And essentially what the action plan and the European Green Deal are saying that massive investments will be needed both on the private and public side to help the, uh, the economy change um, essentially towards the 2050 decarbonization targets consistent with Paris Agreement. So these renewed sustainable finance strategy consultation essentially um, a precursor to EU strategy on how to channel private finance in particular again to help help the economy. And, and then the the consultation goes is quite exhaustive, isn't it? Asking about all the various sort of measures and. Uh, areas that can be that can be focused on from tools and techniques and data to to policy and you you name it. So 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 the you know one question that I wanted to ask you you know which I think allows you to to give a sense of some of your response is that you know many people feel that this is a climate crisis and yet you know the world isn't moving perhaps fast enough. And I know um, you know we all probably saw yesterday Betis Squat CEO of Triodos. Um, put out a, a piece where he was saying, you know, there needs to be penalties uh, and real incentives, you know, around a a assets and banking, etc. Um, how did your members in the in the report, you know, look at the areas of in of incentives? I suppose uh, as that was a question that came out of uh, out of the commission. 
yes, I, I think I'll try to respond like in maybe in three pillars of first of all saying that um, obviously, like I said, banks have uh, a critical role to play because they're seen as essentially blood vessels channeling the finance, the capital where it's needed. And clearly now it's it's needed uh, in the direction towards sustainability. However, I we think that now it's the time for a very a, a, a holistic approach where all stakeholders, both public and private sector, can should put in joint efforts in order to uh, really achieve their strategy. And we think that banks absolutely they have capacity and willingness to help that structural transformation, but we uh, both banks and real economy sector would need some clarity uh, from government from governments on what exactly would need to be made uh, ch changed and made uh, across different industries to help them transition and this will con would need to consider the available resources as of the moment um, different stages of where different industries are uh, in different jurisdictions, even within the EU, and also the available technology. Um, like, for example, you know, the energy sector is uh, still very much dependent on oil and gas, and you, you cannot just uh, switch it off and transition overnight. So those those factors would just need to be um, taken into account. And we think that if we want to move towards that uh, clean, sustainable economy in 2050, a clear roadmap would need to be um, laid out on how this needs to happen. And, and, and Rick, you know, some of the things, the incentives, and I know you spoke in the report about, you know, a, a phasing in uh, removal of tax benefits and su subsidies to high emitting companies, you know, these sort of things are part of a transitionary process, you know, where people like, you know, Triodos speak about changing the risk weighted assets, you know, so it's currently about sort of 20% capital reserve for um, carbon emitting industries and 75% for renewable industries. Your, your feeling is it's this transitionary piece, which is key, is it um, to allow the, un, the unwinding of the carbon economy in a, in a sort of ordered manner? Yes, the, the Trinos article raises a lot of important questions. And um, as, as Tanya mentioned rightly early on, the banks are an important part of the solution, but not the only piece. And there's three sectors between, as uh, she mentioned, public and private. Within the private sector is actually three core groups that need to be aligned in how they have incentives work. There's the issuers, the large corporates, whether they're green or non-green. There's intermediaries like banks in the middle or insurance companies, or there's permanent investors, which insurance companies can be permanent investors, but there's also lots of others like private equity, fund managers, and, and institutions like that. The disclosure standards and the incentives have to be aligned. And one of the objectives of the Commission's overall green program is to create the incentives economically for issuers to want to issue financial instruments which buyers want to buy at the right prices to create that motivation. With the banks in the middle, either as lenders or as capital market uh, arrangers or traders or research providers to, to provide incentives for that mechanism to develop on its own as quickly as possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was interesting, you know, in that regard, I don't know if you noticed yesterday that Microsoft and Unilever and, and 11 others actually came out with a, um, a an approach that they're taking, which is going to make them climate uh, neutral um, to the one and a half degree target. And they don't just want to look after themselves and their scope one, two, three emissions, but also Come up with tools and techniques and, and do purchasing of you know green energy and so on and so forth so i suppose all of those elements you're talking about um you know the the corporates the issuers uh, the asset owners um and the asset management as as well as policy etc all coming in harmony i understand so so one other key question tonya uh, that you raise uh, in the report that i looked at around risk management um you know was uh, was raised and and how what's the role of of risk management, obviously a central function for the financial services industry. How does it play out in this part of the world? 
Uh, yes, sure, and it actually relates to your previous question on on the fact that maybe banks could could be or need to be penalized for lending to so-called brown sectors, and we strongly believe that the risk management framework should like the principles of the risk management framework should remain as they are, even concerning the environmental risk management. Basically, we think that this category of uh, this categories of risks should be incorporated into this in, into the existing framework uh, based on the objective scientific evidence. Uh, that would allow to again measure that risk. So we we don't think this should be a separate category, sort of on top of what's already there. And there is an argument that well, um, brown assets might actually have higher risks, and that's why they need to be penalized, and that's why banks would need to be penalized. But if we're saying we, we're admitting this risks do exist, but we're just saying they should already be reflected through the internal risk management model, so the banking system, rather than uh, through uh, an additional sort of um, um, layer of, I don't know, capital charges, for example. Right, understand. Um, and uh, Rick, I don't know if you want to add anything to that one. Yes, um, the issue of the green supporting factors and brown penalizing factors has been uh, rightly, I think, discussed at the policy level. And as Tanya mentioned, the, the large banks all have extensive risk management teams. And the capital framework developed by at the global level and the European level um, has rightly focused on capital charges that are associated with certain levels of risk. Um, if you start entering distortive factors to basically achieve certain policy goals, you're turning those financial institutions into political institutions. And the large banks, for example, they're all owned by shareholders. They're not public in the, in the sense of state-owned institutions. If you have a state-owned institution, it rightly should be subjected to other political views. Share, it, it, from a bank's perspective, they're um, motivated at the board level, at the shareholder level, to look at how to develop the best returns as well as other factors over the longer term. So our members do feel strongly that capital charges should reflect risk. If you get back to the investors who are really important and essential to this whole process, it's important to step back and look at the incentives that they have for uh, green equity loans and bonds at prices which make sense for the corporate issuers. And it varies depending upon the type of investors. For certain investors, tax incentives can really make a big difference, particularly for the equity in instruments to, do, to motivate people to buy the risk capital that really we need to move the green agenda forward. Others, for example, the asset management side of things, it's disclosure. So they can then make the case to their pension fund asset owners and the asset owners, governors, the board of directors of the pension funds, they can decide how they then want to allocate their money based upon their asset owners' policy objectives. That's a really important distinction. Yeah, I see. And I mean, interestingly, just as a follow on to that, you know, the asset owner community seems to be getting quite progressive. And, and you know, if you look at just the Church of England pension fund as one uh, illustration of one that's getting quite progressive and saying, look, we're very much on this agenda. Um, so as they provide their mandate then through to their asset managers, and I know they've done a lot of work with people like London Stock Exchange using the Transition Pathway Initiative, um, it, are you saying it's that sort of um, reflection coming through to the managers uh, which is needed uh, before you get the, uh, the response? Absolutely, because the asset managers work for the asset owners. They have contracts, they have investment contracts, who, um, and then, so it's up to, for example, in the Church of England's case, is to make a policy decision. What are their overall objectives? Is it, for example, ESG only investment? And how does the overall rate of return factor into that? In the last few months, there's been some statistics that have shown that on balance, many ESG related funds have actually outperformed non ESG focused funds, although that varies from time to time. And the key issue, however, is the fund management community will be reacting to what the asset owners tell them to do. 
Mm. And that will that will vary case by case. Some asset owners are only interested in maximizing return rather than social objectives. Other funds will be very focused on social objectives. And that's where the marketplace needs mm. motivation and incentives. It's a really important area. Yeah, absolutely. That's great for that clarification. Thank you. Now, when we come to, um, you know, the thorny question of ESG data, um, you've touched on this in, you know, in some detail as well in, in the report. Tell us a bit more about your observations there, Tonya. Uh, sure. Uh, so, so basically, uh, the question of of the availability of ESG data is quite acute. I mean, Frankly, it's been only maybe a few years since some of the vol voluntary um, frameworks have been uh, established at the international level to encourage uh, companies across the world to report on E, S and G. And those, I would say, there has been good uptake, but still it, it's, it's not really mainstream. But Clearly, with the ambition to reach by 2050, uh, there is a need for, I would say, all, I mean, all companies that have environmental, social impact to be able to report what environmental and social impact they have. So what our members see in particular is that it's uh, indeed there is an insufficient level of disclosure uh, by issuers, by corporates, that frankly this is due to the lack of uh, harmonized standards established um, and primarily internationally, internationally, I would say. So what the EU has done recently, uh, the, the, they've launched an initiative to establish an EU-wide sustainability reporting standard. And uh, we very much welcome that initiative as, as we think that would, would help um, bring in that comparability uh, and reliability of uh, data, especially if additional assurance procedures are established around the data. So we would very much welcome that. We also think there is an acute issue of accessibility of that type of data by, well, especially smaller market players like SMEs. Um, clearly, there are a lot of ESG data providers, but the concern is that, well, first, they're quite costly for the small businesses. Second is that the output or the data provided by those ESG data providers can vary significantly for basically the same issue. So an, another concern uh, regarding the, uh, the reliability of that type of data. So we do think that we do see a merit um, of having some sort of centralized resource at the EU level to help promote accessibility and affordability of that data. We. I mean, we do understand that it would take a while still for, you know, for the reporting standards first to be established and then for the companies to start reporting uh, on them. Um, so we, you know, we are very much in favor of uh, innovation, digital tools that could help the collection of that, that data in the meantime when the action is needed. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting correct because it's 2050 you know, he's a long way out. If you're in the science side of uh, climate uh, crisis, you know, that's uh, that's too late, right? So um, when you look at the tools, which was another piece that you went on to in the report, and um, you obviously touched on the use of geospatial data and then gathering um, that data and analyzing it using machine learning and artificial intelligence and using some of the innovation labs of, you know, the various banks and, and central banks. Tell us more about, about how you could how people could get activated and what your thoughts were in that area. Yeah, I, uh, like I said, we, we, uh, we very much encourage the uh, uh, synergy of the digital transformation and sustainability transformation. Um, we, you know, technology more generally seen as the enabler for the change of how, how we live, how economies operate, and for optimization of many processes. So it should absolutely work as an enabler, you know, to change 
uh, towards a, a low carbon economy. So you rightly picked up that we believe that such existing tools as artificial intelligence and machine learning can really help um, deal with some of the issues that I mentioned, like for example, the availability of data, they can collect the information that is otherwise is not available, geospatial imaging, it, you know, those tools can help process uh, volumes of information and sort of unstructured information somewhere uh, in the world just in, you know, and help um, deliver some out, well, meaningful decision, useful information that can be used going forward. We we think because this issue is so, it, it, it's so uh, important and requires uh, attention immediately, I would say, uh, we would encourage some cross-sectoral approach to data sharing among different sectors. Um, well, that could be on the data on CO2 emissions, energy use, uh, climate risk mapping, um, and, and and frankly others. So we do encourage EU policymakers to really maximize that potential of digital tools, and we we know that that's another um, big priority on their agenda. So we would welcome the tandem. That's fantastic, and I think that I I may get the name wrong, but it's the EU sustainability platform, um, which is one of the next steps they're moving into now, which which might be the, the mechanism, if I've got that right. Um, Rick, just we covered quite a lot there around um, ESG and tools, etc. Was there anything um, that you wanted to add to, to Tom, Tanya's comprehensive answer? Yes. Um, it, what, what Tanya described, I think, are is the reality of competitive forces um, for data not necessarily wanting to convene. There's a, there's a very strong element of when, in competition among the different types of participants, whether they're corporates, banks, investors, data providers, or other, I would call it market infrastructure. And the European Commission's program is intended to motivate competition at all levels where it can. Okay. We do feel the taxonomy, which was an important part of this whole puzzle, is really important, however, because what you don't want people is endlessly creating their own taxonomies because that will diffuse um, uh, understanding, harmonization, and the ability, particularly by the asset owners and the asset managers, to evaluate really what is green. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the market about greenwashing, about whether investments held by various types of funds that call themselves green, whether they're in equity and loans or bonds, uh, that's still, I think, a very much real concern in the market and the taxonomy can do a, a lot of positive impact on that. What the challenge is, is how to motivate these disparate competitors in markets, including data providers, to actually uh, develop toward a standard which um, commercially motivates people to follow them. And that process probably hasn't been completed yet. That will be ongoing for quite a while. Uh, we in the banking sector fully support that. The banks have an important role to play in helping and, and uh, motivating and moving forward with those uh, a, a set of standards that work for the corporates as well as the buy side. But getting back to one of the things I mentioned at the beginning, the alignment of all these standards is really important because if the banks as intermediaries, whether as lenders or as market arrangers, can't get the data from the corporates, which will eventually throw through the banks to to investors or directly from the corporates to investors, the standardization, the comparability is going to take a lot longer. So we do think there's a lot of urgency to try to focus on that as quickly as possible. You think, I mean, on this, there's, a, you know, some places standards are needed. And as you say, some places they're not. I mean, you need standard reporting because we need to know, you know, that output and we need to then benchmark it. In terms of the data, you need to know the provenance of the data, but it doesn't necessarily need to be standardized uh, because, of course, it can standardized in its technical format, so you can read it, but not standardized in where it came from. Um, you know, if I take some satellite data, you know, that might give me a unique edge, as you were saying. Um, and as long as in my reporting, it's clear where that came from, I would imagine I imagine that's okay. So there's there's we talk about standardization. There's layers where it needs to be standardized, technically reporting, 
but then where it just needs to be have an audit trail from where it came from. Is, is that right? <clears throat> uh, yes, yes, absolutely, Richard. Essentially, the um, the point around such a standardization that we're uh, making here is that it's it's important to have standardized reporting to an extent to promote comparability of that information, like for investment and for investors to look at different companies, they need to understand what. Uh, possibly key performance indicators uh, are pertinent to maybe different types of uh, companies or sectors so that they can compare and make their investment decision. However, I, I do agree that especially in this space, um, when it comes to data itself, it can, it can serve as an ed or again as an enable enabler right to the uh, any standardized reporting requirements as such because uh, especially with the with the digital tool tools you can um, get that information externally that might not be even uh, available from you know from the reporting entities yeah and that, then that allows your market dynamic to happen Rick doesn't it because some people are yeah Yes, um, our association has been very engaged on a very similar data standardization collection exercise uh, through the European Commission on MIPIT, the Market and Financial Instruments Directive that's been outstanding for a couple of years. And it, its goal, rightly, was to improve transparency in the reporting of trades in equities and fixed income and other instruments. And the system is developing. It's not quite there yet. There are, our members still recommend quite a few tweaks to make it um, easier to understand, more consistent. But I think in the context of sustainable finance, uh, there could be a what's happened in other product areas is basically development of a minimum set of reporting standards which are harmonized, which everybody agrees are necessary for comparability. Mm -hmm. But then you can have other optional fields reported which actually maintain an element of competition. And that already happens. For example, lots of the analytical data providers in sustainable finance already provide a lot of data beyond what people might be consider um, um, uh, bare essentials, and people are willing to pay for that. And we want to encourage that. Uh, but I think the core for the next stage of this policy discussion is what are the fields and what data are the minimum that everybody needs. So that's a, a really comprehensive review. Um, Tonya, tell us what next uh, and uh, what else can we expect from AFNI? Uh, thanks, Richard. I probably want to reiterate that transition process will be key and it would be pivotal uh, for both the private and public sectors to work together to ensure that that transition is sustained. And, and we and the public and the private sector really need some guidance and clarity from governments as to how this transition could happen and what exactly would need to be done and expected from private sector to um, to just achieve the the objectives that uh, the EU Green Deal uh, laid out to achieve. Gotcha. Yes, just to build on Tanya's comments, um, what we're calling for is really further clarity and there's a lot more work to be done in terms of developing industry specific roadmaps that fill in blanks in milestones between now and 2050 that create more accountability, more measurability and more deliverability of uh, getting closer to that low carbon um, goal. Um, that includes collection of better data. Uh, includes uh, developing stronger public-private partnerships and, and it includes a stronger sense of risk assessment. So what Tanya mentioned is the interaction between us and policymakers is really essential to doing that. But we feel there's still a lot more work to be done. But the Commission broadly, I think, has done, I think our members feel they've done a pretty good job in pulling together the right initiatives so far. Uh, there needs to be a further push um, urgently to keep this going. Fantastic. Great point on which to finish. Thanks so much for your time today, Tonya and Rick.